afterwards. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the second in the speaker series uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. I'm James Litley. I'm the Operations and Grants Manager for the Okanagan Basin Water Board. And tonight is really about having a conversation about water issues. And we're uh, very pleased and fortunate to be joined by an international water expert. Um, when I say we, I mean myself and Dr. Anna Warwick-Sears, who is the Executive Director of the Okanagan Basin Water Board. So Anna, if you'd uh, maybe like to make some opening comments. Thanks. Well, I don't want to interfere too much with your introduction, James, but I do want to welcome everyone, starting with Mr. Seth Siegel. It's great to have you here. Uh, I read through Seth's book this week that we'll be discussing tonight, and uh, I'm all pumped up. I want to talk about everything. Uh, the book was published in 2015, and uh, I know that there's probably been some changes since then, so I want to cover what we all of the cool stuff from the book that relates to our situation here. And I also hope that we can talk about what has happened since then and, and what you see for the future. But I'm just really excited about this evening and getting a chance to talk to you. And uh, I'm really pleased that you could make time in your schedule to come. And, uh, and I wanna, of course, uh, welcome everybody out in the Okanagan listening audience for coming as well. So. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being our MC and our guide on this one, James. Thanks, Anna. So I'd like to introduce Seth and then we'll talk just briefly about um, the reason that his book is so exciting to us on the Okanagan, both his first book and his second, which we'll talk about as well. So Seth M. Siegel is a lawyer, an activist, a serial entrepreneur, and the author of the internationally acclaimed New York Times bestseller, Let There Be Water. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and leading publications in Europe and Asia. He's spoken on water policy hundreds of times around the world, including in Congress, the United Nations, the World Bank, and at dozens of leading universities. He's married, the father of three, and he lives in New York City. Seth, welcome. I'm delighted to be here, but I have to say first that I'm sorry that I'm not here uh, actually physically, corporeally, and only uh, digitally or virtually. Uh, uh, you live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. And uh, as I've also come to get to know you and Anna and Corey, uh, it's really been a pleasure developing a wonderful, warm friendship and relationship. So I, I hope that we can make this up and figure out a time uh, for me to come physically and, and say hello to you and your wonderful guests and, and engage with uh, them as well but uh, I'm delighted to be invited in any format, uh, digital or, or live. Great, and we're, we're super happy you could join us even if virtually and in spirit though today. Thank you. So for folks who might not be familiar with some of Seth's work, uh, we want this to really be a conversation. Anna and Seth and I'll be having, uh, sharing questions back and forth, but we'd also like you to participate. So please feel free to enter your questions in the question and answer box. And just to get us primed and ready to go, um, this is quoting from uh, Let There Be Water, and I realize my screen is probably mirrored and that came out backwards. But when Seth talks about water issues in Israel, here's a sample of what he talks about. Consider what Israel does in pursuit of clean, safe, available anytime water. Pumps and purifies natural water from its aquifers, wells, rivers, and the Sea of Galilee. Desalinates seawater. Drills deep wells to get brackish water develops seeds that thrive on salty water, treats nearly all of its sewage to a high level of purity and reuses it on crops, captures and reuses rainwater, discourages landscaping of parks or homes that consume fresh water, seeds rain clouds to enhance rainfall, demands all appliances, especially toilets, be hyper water efficient, replaces infrastructure before leaks begin and promptly fixes leaks when they appear educate school children as to the value of water conservation, prices water to encourage efficiency, gives financial incentives for technologies that save water, experiments with ideas to reduce evaporation, transformed its agriculture to grow water efficient crops, and uses drip irrigation for most of its agriculture. So that's quite a list and it's actually a very exciting book to read through. And I'd just like to start Seth by asking- Oh, oh wait, wait. I want to inter I want to interrupt. 
I want to say that another thing that he says in that section is that by using all of these different techniques, Israel has gone from being a water poor country to a water wealthy country, and they do not feel like they have any water shortages at all. So I just want to provide that as the bigger context for the people who are out there listening who haven't read the book yet. Great. Thanks, Anna. You mean those one or two people who haven't memorized it yet? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so Seth, what got you interested in water and why did you choose Israel as kind of the subject for your first book? Well, uh, the second part followed the first part. Uh, and let me make clear that um, I was not, I did not think of myself as a book writer. Uh, as you said in that very generous introduction, I had been a lawyer, I had been a businessman. Uh, I had the good fortune of, of uh, leaving the business world thanks to a, a sale of my business. And about 20 years ago, I decided to become a full-time do-gooder. Um, and I got involved in a whole variety of different activities uh, as a, some degree as a donor, but uh, mostly as an activist. And um, among those things, I started studying the Middle East. And we don't have to go into here why and what I was doing and such, but uh, although that has its own interesting story, of course, at least to me. Uh, but, um, but as I studied more about the Middle East, I discovered that a very significant part of the problems of the region are tied to water scarcity. And so having been to the region many times and knowing that, for example, that, uh, that generally speaking, water scarcity comes with certain types of activities and behaviors, not just climate change, but also rapid economic growth, fast population growth, and things of that sort, I assume that Israel, which has the fastest rate of uh, population growth in the world since its foundation in 1948, uh, since it's the third fastest growing economy in the world after Singapore and South Korea in that same time period, I assumed that I was going to discover that Israel was a, was, a, was a water basket case. Add to that, that it, thanks to climate change, it gets about a third less water uh, from rain than it did uh, just 25 years ago. Uh, it rains only seasonally from about November to about March, and even then not robustly. So I, I was certain that I was going to discover that Israel had a very big problem. And when I learned that Israel had an abundance of water, I thought to myself, this is something that needs further scrutiny because I already knew that, um, that the world itself had a significant water shortage problem existing and coming much worse. And I'll step back to say that I had been reading some United Nations studies that suggested that by the year 2030, as much as a third of the world's population was gonna be experiencing some severe water scarcity problems, and that by the year 2050, it could be as much as two thirds of the world's population suffering this. And this, of course, is partially because of population growth, partially because of uh, greater economic activity. But in any event, it occurred to me, and I know a lot of elected officials and government, government leaders, and mostly in the US, but other countries as well. And it seemed to me that there wasn't enough focus on what we could do to fix that. So I started looking around for a model and, and lo and behold, after I'd learned about Israel, I see, saw other countries that are also very water efficient. Australia is one, um, Singapore is another. And I thought that maybe I would write a book that covered the three of them. I ended up not doing so because I spoke with some very senior Australian government officials and they said, look, most of what we do, we learn from Israel. So it, it, we, we're glad to have the positive PR, but in fact, if you're going to write about us, you should really be writing about Israel. I said, well, I am. And they said, okay, good. And then, then I started thinking about Singapore. And, and you know, although Singapore has, has evolved into a democratic state of sorts, its long history is, is authoritarianism with a very strict government. Um, and it occurred to me that, that for that reason, and one other I'll share in a second, that Singapore also wasn't quite a great model because the fact that we, we want to model for democracies. We want to model for places where people can choose to do what they want to do and not be coerced into it. And the other reason is Singapore is really more of a, a city state than a nation. They have no agriculture, uh, which in, in most of the world consumes between 70 and 90% of the fresh water. So I said, you know, if they don't have agriculture, then really how good of a model are they for South American countries with big agricultural issues or Middle Eastern countries and so forth. So I ended up writing uh, just about Israel and, I, and I'm glad that I did because Israel proved at least to me to be a very inspiring and exciting uh, destination for this kind of conversation. Yeah, I, I found certainly the example that you used uh, inspiring and something that surprised and um, impressed me was that 
the book is really more than just a book about water it, and water of course is all pervasive and so you talk about the history of Israel and how they've developed and the the impetus for them to develop their extensive water infrastructure new water technology and innovation um, I was surprised to learn that they were really population limited by um, kind of when they were set up because the British figured that there wasn't enough water in the land to um, afford the population that they ended up getting. So, well, you, you know, actually, I, I, obviously, I, you want to talk more about local affairs and more current events than the 1930s and 1940s. But, it, but what you raise is actually a very, very tragic, uh, horrible thing. Um, I don't exactly remember the date of Kristallnacht. That was the night that the Nazi, uh, 19, November of 1938, but I know it was November. And, and, uh, but November 1938, the Nazis begin in full, full scale efforts and attempt to make clear to all the Jewish citizens of Germany that uh, it's a very different game. It's not just rhetorical. It's not just Hitler making these horribly anti-Semitic speeches, but there were going to be consequences. Jews get round up, sent to concentration camps, Jewish businesses closed, Jews not permitted to go to universities or schools, Jews having to wear the Jewish star thereafter, and so forth. And so at the exact same time, the Great Britain was, uh, was controlling the Middle East. It was before you know, the decolonialization period begins in earnest, although Egypt was independent in the 1920s. And, um, and the UK, um, issues this thing called the white paper, which decrees that, that uh, no more Jewish immigration is gonna be permitted into the land of Israel, into Palestine. And um, at that very moment, Jews were feeling this claustrophobia all throughout Europe and they desperate to get out. I mean, it wasn't just in Germany they, or Austria, they knew they had a problem. I mean, all throughout Europe, they knew this, something very bad was coming. They didn't know how, ba how bad. And so they tried to get visas to get out and particularly to get to, to uh, Palestine or the land of Israel and the Brits blocked them. Now the Brits didn't say we're blocking you just, just this, they, they gave a reason. And the reason they gave was, they said there isn't enough water here. And that led to one man in particular, completely forgotten to history, um, uh, his name is Semcha Blas. He was, a, I, I liken him to Leonardo da Vinci. He was a genius of water. He was the one who thought up basically everything that we are doing everywhere in the world today was, comes from his notebooks, which I've poured through. Um, they're ironically not in, uh, in Israel, they're in Stanford University's archives. Uh, but, I, um, but, but he begins doing all this. And by the end of World War II, of course, tragically, millions of Jews, six million Jews have been murdered by the Nazis because they couldn't get out. And the Brits said, you know, there's no room for these people. There's not enough water for these people. And uh, Bloss demonstrated in his documents, that, and that, which was presented to the British every year from 1938 through 1945, he, he demonstrated how with the use of technology, you could transform the water profile of the area. And now today, of course, you know, in, the, in the envelope of what was you know, Gaza, the West Bank, Israel, at that time was 2 million people, and the British felt that, I'm sorry, it was 1.4 million people, and the British said that it could never grow beyond 2 million people. It was, a, it was a natural barrier, a natural ceiling. And today, of course, um, you know, there's about two, four, there's, a, there's about like close to 15 million people in that envelope right now. And they live pretty good lives. Yeah, and what's interesting is the state of Israel is only about twice the size, the land size of the Okanagan Valley. <laughs> so when I think about this, and I, I uh, prepared a little background for Seth on the Okanagan, and one of the things we talked about was how there really isn't that much water. The Okanagan is the most water stressed region in Canada, but the settlers who came here, um, and of course this is the traditional unceded territory of the Okanagan Silks people who had been managing the water uh, and living in harmony with the water for thousands of years before the settlers. But the settlers came in and immediately started irrigating and created orchards. And so when visitors come now today, they see this lush valley with a huge lake and there's a kind of a myth of abundance. And so where Israel kind of started from scratch and realized in order to bring the, the population in, um, the Okanagan kind of brought the population in and, and it's been a lot more ad hoc, I would say, than the, the evolution that's happened in Israel. Well, I don't know if that was a deliberate, you know, uh, softball pitch for me to, to swing at, but because uh, we didn't rehearse this, I should make clear to the audience. But, uh, but that is sort of a, a softball pitch because that is if, you know, you read that list, but what was implied in that list 
but not explicitly said by me in the, in, at that point in the book, I say it elsewhere, is that what makes it so special is that Israel has had a master plan for water from basically from 1948 when the state declares independence in May of 1948. And while I was working on the book, I, I, I interviewed the person who was in charge at this government, uh, uh, independent government uh, company, uh, 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 the Israel Water Authority. Um, and what was his job? His job was to do the master plan for Israel's water needs in the year 2050. So, so I thought to myself, this is utterly incredible. You know, there are places in the world that I had interviewed that were muddling through what they were going to do that very calendar year. And here was 2012, 2013, 2014, when I was doing the research. And, and this fellow was already working on the year 2050. And he had, I'm not talking about like a pie in the sky kind of stuff. He had detailed stuff about pipelines and, and what kind of technologies would be needed and things that hadn't been invented yet. He said, we will need something to be invented that will address this or that problem. So it was really very exciting to see. And I think that that, I have a couple of hope, hope for takeaways for readers from this book, because the book is not just meant for water professionals. In fact, it's hardly meant for them. It's meant really more for ordinary citizens to get them excited and activated. Um, and, and so the big takeaway is, is that you really can have a fantastic water future if you plan for it. And that, and that water problems, the great thing about water problems is they come at you very, very slowly. And so it gives you a lot of time to prepare for it. So the Okanagan, when I, I don't know how long ago it was that you first realized, uh-oh, <laughs> you might have a problem. But it wasn't like yesterday that uh, suddenly it's uh-oh. You have a long lead time. And I would argue you still have time. But if you don't do something, if you're just ignoring it forever, sooner or later, you're going to get very severely bitten, as has happened and as is happening all around the world where countries are not paying attention to water scarcity and uh, issues and water quality issues. Yeah, Anna, did you have anything so far? Oh, I wonder if we've lost Anna maybe. No, I see, I see Anna right there. Oh, Anna, Anna, you have to unmute yourself though. There you go. Okay. My computer's out of control. No, I was gonna say <laughs> that in a way, the existence of a, of a bigger, higher level planning process and a, and a different way to think about it um, more holistically may be the thing that should be on that list that, that these are all elements of a big plan. And maybe that's the thing that is more different than anything else that we're doing here in British Columbia. Uh, we got a question in the question mark box that said, can those management strategies be suggested for a, large, for a large country with a wide range of climates where water management is one of the main issues or are they more context specific? And I think um, I'll let you answer that question specifically, but I think that the difference would be to look at each country and each country's issues and then address it with that sort of holistic long-term planning approach. It's I, I, ironic that Canada, with one of the largest supplies in fresh water in the world, has pockets of water scarcity, you know, some places chronically, but in many places it's just kind of periodic, perpetual. Look, uh, my answer is pretty much similar to your answer to that question. I think that's a very, very astute question. I, I thank you for it. Um, and I, I, I want uh, to urge by, by understanding that I open my book within a few a few sentences into my book by saying that not everything Israel has done is right for every country, every community, every region in the world. But We're not doing cloud seeding. Yeah, I don't think you are. But Israel doesn't do much of it, that much of it either. But, but I mean, they do a little bit. But, but, but what I can say is the but is, is the fact that there are two things that are for sure correct. One is that some of the things that Israel is doing is valuable for every country and every region. Uh, in the world. And second of all is, as Anna very astutely pointed out, what is most important though, is to be thinking about water in a particular kind of way. And if that's Israel's gift to the world, 
about water, aside from the technologies, which we can talk about later, but, or not at all. But, uh, but the, 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 big, the big thing there is the fact of the way they think about it. I, I, I liken to say to, to audiences is that most people who have never been to Israel know at least one thing about Israel, and that is that militarily, Israel has figured out how, despite its tiny size and tiny relative population to the you know, massive uh, antagonist, at least until recently, population of the region, Israel has become a great military power. Some people say it's the fifth or sixth greatest military in the world with a very small standing army of just a few hundred thousand, uh, not even a few hundred thousand people. Uh, the second thing, if you know a little bit more about Israel, you'll know is that Israel is the world's best immigrant absorption process and system. They have doubled and redoubled and redoubled in size by welcoming immigrants from uh, Jewish Jews from Arab countries who were expelled, the Holocaust survivors who had were homeless and nowhere to go in Europe, uh, Ethiopian Jews, Black Jews of Africa, Russian Jews in large numbers from 89 to the mid 90s. They've become very expert in immigration absorption. But the third great thing about Israel, aside from security and immigration, and this is by design, is it's not, oh, we're going to have the world's best healthcare system. It's not, we're going to have the world's best, uh, you know, infrastructure with light rail or whatever. They made a decision early on that we're going to have the world's best water system. And when you focus on it, when you put money against it, when you put your best minds against something, you end up with very, very good outcomes almost always. And so it's just a question of prioritization. And to that, to whoever that questioner was, I would like to suggest that that's the biggest takeaway. I, if I may just jump in and say one more thing. Since we're not going to get to everything tonight, and since this is really my life's work and I love engaging with people, I just, if I may just do so for a second, uh, James and Anna, I just want to say that anybody who has a question, they're shy or they think of something like 10 minutes after the thing is over or two days from now, I want to offer you that you can reach out to me. I'm accessible. I answer all my, I get a lot of email, but I try to answer them all within 24 hours. And you can reach me through my website, which is www.sethm, like Mary, Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L.com, uh, like the name, but all scrunched together, or through me on Twitter, at Seth M. Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L. And, and I'll be more than delighted to engage and to learn from you and to have a dialogue with you. Uh, I, I get communications literally every day and I've, so I've been doing this for years now and I just love the interaction. So anybody who's out there who doesn't feel good doing it right now or thinks of it later, please do be in touch. Thanks, Seth. And I'll, I'll attest that he does answer his emails, which is why we're so fortunate to have him join us today. <laughs> um, you were talking about, uh, you know, what most people know about Israel. And one of the things I don't think most people know, and one of the things that probably gets lost when we're talking about conflicts in the region, is uh, Israel's exportation of water to neighboring countries. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, which I, I don't want to go into all the diplomatic stuff right now, unless you want me to. But, but, but Israel, this is a measure of Israel's water abundance that I like to talk about this more in terms of how water abundant Israel is, rather than simply explaining the diplomatic history. And, and that is that, uh, as if people know the map of the region at all, they may not, is Israel... Uh, is on the Mediterranean. It's got a very long coastline along the Mediterranean. And then a very tiny dot on the southern tip of Israel is, is, in, uh, is on the Red Sea, an ocean city called uh, Eilat. Um, but most of the country's population lives in the uh, northern one-third of the country. The bottom two-thirds of the country is desert and uh, has led to desert agriculture, which is a fascinating area, which we may get into later. And, and, but Israel's, uh, Israel has Palestinian neighbors to its south and to its east in the West Bank and in Gaza. And for a very long time now, Israel has been providing a vast amount of water to both of them. The Palestinians in the West Bank get 60% of their household water from Israel. In Gaza, even during periods of conflict when rockets flying out of, out of Gaza, the flow of water has never been interrupted by Israel. About 15% of the water in Gaza comes from Israeli sources and reason to believe that there'll be a lot more soon, at least I hope so. I, I, I've given some suggestions about how to make that happen, both in the book and to some world leaders. Um, and, um, and then in addition, it provides between 10 and 15% of the total uh, fresh water uh, consumed in the Kingdom of Jordan consumed for non-agricultural purposes, uh, consumed in the Kingdom of Jordan. And as I write about in my book, there was a program put together that would expand that 
by multiples for the Kingdom of Jordan um, by virtue of a very innovative idea that would take salty water from the Red Sea. And although it's south, its it, altitude is higher than where the Dead Sea is, which is the lowest point on Earth, and to, and to send ocean water uh, northward, but, but down slope, create hydroelectricity by doing so, desalinate that water, give virtually all of that water to new Israeli desert farms, and Israel would then take an equal amount of water and give it to Amman, Jordan, the capital city of Jordan, um, uh, where the water is very badly needed. And, and th that, that has gone through fits and starts as, uh, through domestic uh, Jordanian politics, has stopped it a few times. But I'm, I'm a very optimistic person, and I think ultimately people make the right decisions, and ideology fades away when your children are thirsty. And so this is something that I think is going to happen sooner or later, and it's going to be great for the region as well. So I think that, um, I, and, and I might add also to what it's worth. Israel exports actual physical water, as I said, to Gaza, the West Bank, and Jordan. But Israel, in addition, provides training and education to people in more than a hundred countries on how to make better, optimized use of um, uh, of their water uh, by virtue of um, uh, training in a whole variety of different technologies that Israel offers, from agriculture to desalination to reuse of sewage uh, and so forth. Can we go to and talk a bit more about agriculture? Because I thought that part was really interesting. Yeah, um, sure. Just that the, the agricultural, um, you know, has been able to expand into the desert, the development of the drip irrigation and, and the new crop types and so forth. But I, I just wanted to start, um, and I'll let you riff on this, but but the first question that came to me was wondering um, if agricultural water was subsidized. That was one question. And then you talked about, and one of the uh, one of the participants here mentioned that there is. Uh, she was impressed when she visited there how there was um, uh, different crops were encouraged to be grown in different regions, and and whether it was the cost of the water that was driving the uh, which crops were grown there and the type of crops that were grown or if there if there is some kind of government intervention or or how do they manage all of that in yeah great great water? yeah there's tons to talk about about agriculture and I'm, I'm glad to talk about the two areas that you've asked about subsidies and and uh, crops selection um, and also it's worthwhile talking about the kind of water that is used for that um, in 1952, when Israel still had enough water, but as I mentioned, they were looking way, way, way over the horizon, they said to themselves that, you know, if we are successful in attracting people from all over the world and through natural growth as well, we are going to run out of water. The British were not wrong in that theory, but Simcha Blas, who then was running the water show uh, for Israel, the, the Da Vinci type guy that I mentioned earlier, um, he suggested that they needed to do a bunch of different things, some infrastructure building and so forth. But one of the big ideas was, how about if we aggregate all of our sewage, clean it to a very high level, create a parallel national water infrastructure system, because people are not going to want to drink that, even though it's pure enough to drink, and then use it exclusively for agriculture. So that was the first thing. Now, in the early years of the state, uh, water was subsidized for nearly everybody, as is the case virtually everywhere in the world. But one of the great ahas, one of the great wow insights that they had uh, quite a number of years ago was that subsidies distort economic uh, behavior. And that when something is subsidized, you don't get the proper economic signals. The, you know, the price, price plays a role in people being more focused on conservation or on taking innovation to heart or doing different types of behaviors. And when water is free, or tantamount to free or highly subsidized, it distorts behaviors. So they made a decision to, de to, to get rid of all of the subsidies. They phased it in uh, uh, more slowly for farmers than for uh, people in the cities. But today, all of the water of Israel is without subsidy. The, the, uh, the water that has been taken to be uh, reused water, you know, the water from sewage that's been highly treated and now reuse, is used only for agriculture. A little more than half of all the agricultural activity in Israel is, is a result of reused water. 
Uh, the other half is not just, by the way, fresh water. There's a very big program to drill for brackish water in the desert, which is otherwise has no use. They desalinate it at the source and they use that also for desert agriculture. Uh, and that, that, those types of mechanical uses lead to about two thirds of the water of Israel being manufactured water, either brackish water, desalinated water, which we'll get to talk about later, I'm sure, at least briefly, and, and uh, sewage that's treated is, comes to about two thirds of all water used in Israel, agriculture and otherwise. So today there are no subsidies whatsoever. And guess what? People respond to incentives. <laughs> so when people, and, and this again, people can have all the water they want. They, they, so that the way that the controls are done is not by supply, it's by demand. So that it's, it's like you can have all the water you want as long as you are prepared to pay for it. You can have as much steak or fancy European vacations or yachts as you would like, Anna, but nobody is gonna pay for that other than you. So you're going to ration your own decisions based upon available cash and you know how crazy you are, which we know you are very crazy. So of course you have 10 yachts, I know that. Uh, and, and Looking and so at forth. electric bicycles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Almost as good as a yacht. <laughs> so, so that's the first thing. So the second thing is, the second thing is, is that in terms of the crops, again, whoever asked the question or, or it was your own question, you put your finger on something extremely important. And that is, it goes back to the great economist, Adam Smith, which I, I didn't write about in my book, but, but who has been a great influence on me ever since I, I learned who he was when I was in college. And, and that is that, that countries, when subsidies are removed, will engage in rational behaviors. So within a matter of a few years of subsidies being removed on water, guess what? Cotton, which had been grown in great quantities, mm -hmm. but is the second most water consumptive crop, cotton stopped being grown by almost every farmer in Israel. Alfalfa, which is the <laughs> single largest consumer of water of any crop, completely stopped being grown in Israel. And the theory is, hey, we can buy it cheaper from water abundant places or from places that are crazy and choosing to grow cotton or choosing to grow alfalfa there. And citrus likewise, citrus was once, you know, um, uh, citrus was once the great crop of, of Israel. And citrus now is a very small amount of the produce of Israel. So they use, they do very highly water efficient crops, but on top of that, they're using recycled water. And on top of that, almost universally, they're using technology to reduce the amount of water further. And that's what you mentioned earlier about drip irrigation. They drip, drip irrigation was invented in Israel, by the way, utterly coincidentally, by Simcha Blas, <laughs> after he leaves government service. <laughs> I tell the story about how this happens. He invents drip irrigation. I mean, he's 59 years old, he's on a, he's on a pension, and you know, he's got some downtime. So he invents something that revolutionizes world agriculture. <laughs> and uh, as I said, Leonardo da Vinci. So. Um, a blast invents uh, drip irrigation. And by 1970 or 72, I'm forgetting now exactly the year, but a long time ago, Israel makes illegal flood irrigation. And virtually everybody, virtually everybody is choosing to, to drip irrigate their crops. Because the, now once you are paying the real price for, once you're, at, uh, once you're paying the real price for your water, you're given a choice. And the choice is use more water, but pay more for it, or substitute technology and grow just as much or more, but use technology, which is cheaper than the extra amount of water. So it turns out to be that, you know, people say there's no substitution for water. It's a very common thing, uh, us water people hear all the time, but it's completely untrue. There is a so substitute. The reason, the reason substitute why I pushed water. that, the reason why I was really uh, wanted to ask that question is because I know talking to a lot of the local uh, agricultural producers here, there's a, a strong interest in, uh, not having people tell them what to grow. And so it wasn't, you know, maybe I missed it in my reading of your book, but it wasn't clear to me whether that was like um, a mandate you know, like planned economy thing yeah. or whether it was just completely market driven from the own producers deciding what, what was, you know, the crop that would make money and yeah. fit the local conditions. Yeah, there was a bit of, there was a small bit of planned economy, which was that they had a, did have an agricultural master plan uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, but that has completely gone away. That doesn't exist anymore. And, and so when you say that local people in, the, in, your, in, the, in the valley or the area 
don't want to be told what to grow. I say, God bless you. That's great. Don't be told. I'm, I'm, there's no one who's a greater believer in free enterprise or d democratic uh, systems than I am. I think that is fantastic. But don't ask, you know, don't ask Anna and James to subsidize that freedom of uh, freedom that you have. Feel absolutely free to grow the most, grow all the alfalfa and all the cotton you'd like. I don't think cotton's right to be where you are, but grow, you know, grow whatever you'd like. And let the spigots run all night long, you know, and take and take a bath and never shut the water off. That's fine. But don't ask your neighbors or your grandchildren when they run out of water to subsidize that decision. As long as you're prepared to pay for it, do it. Fine. Great. I don't think the government should be mandating what you can and can't do. I actually, I don't. I agree with your farmers. But that comes with that is a second piece, which is then don't expect me to subsidize your choices either. So another part of your book in this, it, it, you mentioned that um, the, um, all the water is priced the same throughout the country. Except for, except for the treated water, except for the reused water. Except for the reused water, but the reused water would have a common price throughout the country. And, and yes. in some, I know locally here in Kelowna, the, uh, there's talk about having communities well, they, there's different pricing mechanisms for this, but uh, people who have subdivisions in the hills where it's much harder and more expensive to deliver utilities, they pay more through development cost charges or whatever to recoup the, the cost of that. And in some cases, depending on what their water source is, they actually do pay more for water because it's more expensive to give them that water. And I have talked to people who have said that they feel that um, it would be a subsidy of the people who are living in the, um, you know, the communities around the hillsides would be subsidized by the people who are living in the denser downtown. So it's a kind of a different way of looking at subsidies. If yes. you are, if you have more people who are, to whom it is more expensive to deliver the water, uh, paying the same as people to whom it is inexpensive to deliver the water. I think that that's, I think that that is correct. I think that that is correct. And I have made the same point in conversations with Israelis that I've interviewed, which is when you're, you know, sending water that requires a hundred mile pipeline, that, that in a sense, there, there is a subsidy of a sort, if you're paying the same thing at the end of that hundred mile pipeline as, although it's driven by gravity, as is somebody who is, you know, uh, a, a, a block away from the water treatment plant. I, I, I do agree with that as a concept. The difference would be, if I may say, Anna, is in Israel, um, and this goes to something maybe more sociological or anthropological than economic, and that is that one of Israel's secret to success is that it attempts to be one large community. Well, you know, like every society, there's, you know, there's, there's conservatives and liberals and more religious, and less religious, and, you know, and all that stuff. But, but, but what you have is a, you know, so every society has its fractured uh, and its, its segments. But, but what, it, at least ideologically, the country tries to be one big community. And if you're going to have a communitarian approach, then in a communitarian way, then you don't want to say, oh, well, you're living you know, up there, so you should be paying more for the water. You're living down there, you should pay for less. I think that there's a value in that as well, because you could say that the people who are living further out are reducing air pollution or congestion or things like that in the, in the core area as well. So, so it, it goes back and forth, and it's not mm -hmm. completely pure economically, but it's pretty darn close. It is pretty darn close. So I just want to get a question here that's related that just came in. So when you say pay for water, is there a state cost for the water itself plus the delivery charge or just the delivery charge and therefore free water? Ah, no, 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 no. There is no subsidies at all of any kind. What I mean by that is, is that every single part of the water equation from sourcing it to treating it, to transporting it, to administering it, to, um, to everything. There is not a single penny of public funds, not one single penny that goes into any part of the water equation. Um, and so, and, and so uh, to that regard, the answer is, is, is quite clear, is that that's why it is truly the market price of water. Even, a lot, even in a lot of places where there's quote unquote market price water, 
it, the questioner has it exactly right. In, in many places where that's the case, it's really more the transportation cost. There's no, there's no, nothing for Anna's and your salaries or for the building that you repose in or, or, you know, or any of those other things that are going on in your law lo- in, in the life of the water community. Um, and so, and, and so I think that it's, in, it's relevant to, to, it's relevant to know that when you're talking about putting market forces to work, this is as pure of an example of that as is possibly the case. Now, I, can I say one other thing, which was not asked, but might be, people may be wondering, and I think it's important to say, um, and that is, I, I'm a very big, for those who've read my second book, it's called Troubled Water, it, it was out more recently, uh, for those, you've read it, oh, good man, James, <laughs> so, <laughs> James, I loved you from the start, okay, so, <laughs> okay, so, um, Anyone who's read my newer book knows that I am quite zealous about the question about people being able to afford water. And in Israel also, they address that issue. So that, if, so that in, in the United States, where I know a lot, I don't really know how it goes in Canada. I apologize. I didn't think to ask before we got on the call. But in the United States, there are every year over millions of people who go without water because they have failed to pay their water bills and they get shutoffs. In, in, in Israel, theor- theoretically, that's possible. But if anybody is unable financially to pay for their water, they get subsidized water. But they pay the water bill. In other words, the idea is there's no subsidies. So the subsidy is a subsidy. It goes back to Anna's question about, about uh, different ways of looking at subsidy. In this case, the Ministry of Social Welfare will give a voucher to someone in the same way that the same destitute family will get a voucher for housing, will get a voucher for food, will get a voucher for clothing. And in the same way that universities all over the world have scholarship programs for students who can't afford to pay the full fare. And so, and so the thinking is, and this is my big advocacy point, is that everybody, everybody should be paying for their water, but that anybody who can afford to pay for their water should not go without water. And it's, it, it creates great indignity, it, it, it paralyzes life, it's, it's just a terrible thing. And so we, we need to have a sophisticated system, whether at the federal level or at the provincial level in the case of Canada or the state level in the case of the United States, we need to have a system whereby people who are indigent, we don't just look at their food and their housing, we also need to look at other aspects of their lives. And one of them that gets somehow or other shunted away is water, because the assumption is that whatever the welfare payments are, that that should be able to cover household expenses like that. And I think that's too large of a burden on poor people. So something that ties kind of a lot of these answers and ideas together, and it was very apparent from both the first book, but maybe even more so about the second book, was really about water governance issues. And we, we've been getting a couple of questions, so I'm going to wrap one of the questions or part of one of the questions into this. Um, and it's from our colleague Nelson, who says, coordinating solutions to water problems has a real cost and is a challenge for many water government regimes. How has Israel engaged with a network of government and private sector actors to coordinate solutions to water problems? And maybe speak broadly also just about water governance in in Israel. Yeah, so this is something that I think is not gonna logically happen in other parts of the world because there's a long history of governance that gets locked in, oftentimes by either farming or mining interests, by the way, and you can't figure out a way to get around it. And, and so for example, in the American West, again, I know a lot more about the US than I do about Canada, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm being uh, you know, too American, because uh, I, 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 uh, I really don't mean to be, but I, I think it'll be instructive nonetheless. In the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, as a way of encouraging people to move West, people were, giving, were given homesteads, and giving, given mining rights. And along with that came copious amounts of free water. Now, they were not only given the water, they were told that this was, becomes a property right, which meant that it's like your shirt or your car or your bank account. That's a property right that you can bequeath to your children, grandchildren, great, great, great children, and so forth. And likewise, like your car, you can sell. And likewise, your water rights, you can sell. So you have a very dopey system that encourages waste in, in the American West, because if you don't use it for three consecutive years, you lose it. And what ends up happening is, is, that, is that water planning can't be done in, in an intelligent, comprehensive, society-focused way. 
So what Israel decided to do, and it was not without its own, own controversy, it decided in the early 1950s, again, the state gets created in 1948, in the early 1950s, they, they start having a series of very important conversations with the nation, educating the public as to the choices between a centralized water approach and a everyone for himself approach, and then many choices in between. And by the mid to late 1950s, they finally agree upon a system. Again, not without controversy and didn't pass unanimously in the parliament, but they agree upon a system whereby all of the water of the country will be held in the name of the people by the government, but it's the, it's the people's property, but the government is the caretaker for it, and the government will be the watch, will be the, will be the, the custodian of that water. And, and so the, the joke, it's really not true, of course, but the joke was that if the start of the rainy season in November, you put a bucket on the top of your house, and in March, you went up and took that bucket down, the bucket was yours, but all the water in that bucket belonged to the state. Of course, that's no one would hassle you for that. But that was the, that was the, the expression in Hebrew. And so, and, and so that led ultimately to the creation of what I referred to earlier as the Israel Water Authority which is completely apolitical. There is no one political involved in the organization. The head of the, of the Israel Water Authority is appointed by a designated cabinet minister. And then thereafter, for five years, the head of the Water Authority operates without any interference. Not a single other person in the entire ministry is appointed by a political uh, actor. Everyone is a technocrat. There are economists and there are planners and there are chemists and there are all kinds of stuff like that, but, but not a, one of them is chosen by an elected official or anybody connected with those elected officials. And you have this, therefore, this centralized technocratic system, which thinks about what is the best way of getting the largest amount of water at the lowest price possible to the greatest number of people possible. And this system, you know, obviously some grumbling every so often about pricing or whatever, but there's always abundant water. It's always clean. There's never been a health issue. And so there's really great understanding and appreciation for the fact that they have made a decision to give up a little bit of themselves. I used the word earlier, communitarian. They give up a little bit of themselves for the benefit of their neighbors and their community. But in return, because of this excellent governance, they have ended up with great outcomes. And that's, and that's, the, the, uh, that's one of the key secrets of success. Now, an early question tonight was, or this afternoon for you, tonight for me, was, you know, is everything Israel does relevant to everybody? And the answer in this case may be no. It may be physically and legally and emotionally impossible to get everyone to give up what they have for what might be a better water future. But that doesn't mean that you can't start having more, you know, of Anna and more of James and more of your colleagues coming up with big ideas and big centralized approaches that show everybody how they will benefit from this. And, and if, even if it's tinkering at the margins, getting, I believe, far better outcomes. And we've seen this around the world where countries can't quite break free of a, of a heritage uh, uh, akin to what we discussed with, with where you are, but at the same time have found ways of making the system yet better and, and more efficient for everybody. We do have, I mean, here in British Columbia, the water is owned by the queen. So uh, it's essentially, you know, owned by the state. And uh, you did say that in Israel, people had to get permits for using water. Here, no, for, we, for, for, ag for certain types of agriculture. They had, they had to get permits to grow certain types of crops, yeah. So here we have water licenses where people are allowed you know, are permitted to use a certain volume of water over time. So I'm just confused about how it's different. Like in, in Israel, uh, are the licenses shorter term or are the no, permit? To, there, are no, there are no licenses anymore. Okay. That, 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 I, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear earlier. No, no that, that, that was a, a vestige that has been phased out. It is now, is now driven by technology, by pricing, by free market choices. If somebody wanted to grow cotton today, they could grow cotton. But why would they choose to do that? Why wouldn't they grow something else where it can get them a, a better out, a price outcome? I mean, but if they had some nostalgic um, affection for cotton, because grandpa grew cotton, <laughs> I suppose they could do that, but that would not make a lot of sense. It's pretty. 
It is so pretty. <laughs> it's, and, and you know what else, Anna? It's fluffy. <laughs> One of the questions, and I think we're kind of working our way through it, but maybe we can get to this now and we'll keep talking about them is, can you identify a few of the most important experiences learned from Israel? Yeah, I, I think uh, we've hinted at some of that tonight. I, I, that's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think that there are a handful of, of wonderful lessons. We didn't talk much about technology, and I wouldn't mind using this as an excuse. We want to come back to that. Okay, then, then I'll just give a short drift here. But I think some of the lessons are that um, I, I opened the book by telling the story about, uh, I opened the book by sharing a nursery rhyme that's very popular, at least in the United States. I'm sure it's in Canada as well and a nursery rhyme that's similar, but 180 degrees different in Israel. In, in uh, America, we, uh, we teach our three and four-year-olds, rain, rain, go away, come again some other day. I suspect you have something similar in uh, Canadian nursery schools. Um, in Israel, the, uh, the, the similar song is clip, clop, clip, clop, drip, drop, drip, drop, it's raining, I'm translating, drip, drop, drip, drop, it's raining today, clap hands, clap hands, it's raining, drip, drop, drip, drop. So, so first of all, it's a celebration. Second of all, is starting in, in, in the uh, nursery program when people are three years old, they begin to be educated about the essential nature of water and why you should never waste it. So that's, to my mind, is a very interesting thing. So it begins at the earliest, um, at, at the earliest uh, of, of um, opportunity to educate children as to why it's a social good. It's part of being a good citizen is being a water smart person, a water careful person. And so that's, uh, that's another important takeaway. And so you have a societal, societal sense from the earliest age that water is something important, water is something that I as a citizen have a, an effect on the destiny of my country and my community and that type of education leads to very, very positive outcomes. When people think of themselves as part of the solution, when people are educated as to why conservation is important from the very first time that they can learn anything, and that education continues straight on through, through their teen years, through compulsory military service, through adulthood, through public service announcements, through signs at the beach where you shower after you come out of the water, you know, don't waste water. Uh, you know, it's the signs in Hebrew say it's a shame to waste even a single drop. You know, these are, these are really wonderful parts of public education. So, so I think that that is a very important takeaway. The fact that they have decided on apolitical technocratic governance is a very important takeaway. I think the fact that they have had the courage to finally get to pure market forces with no subsidies for farmers or for, um, or for, for um, city dwellers is really a fantastic uh, event. And, and I, you had said we're going to get to technology, so I won't do it right now. But the fact that Israel has turned this technological genius and focused it on how to take the technology that they care so much about to solve all kinds of global problems and domestic problems, that they have turned that same intensity around the idea of what to do about, about water problems of all kinds. And so, and so I think that that's, that you, 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 you know, you add all that together and you get, uh, you get a, a pretty exciting outcome, I think. Uh, and so those are some of the takeaways. Now, not every one of those necessarily is perfectly aligned with everyone everywhere in the world, but most of it is. Smarter governance, public education, conservation, mentality, um, technology use as a substitute for more, uh, more water or wasted water. And, and I, I think that you add those types of things together and suddenly you start to understand why, uh, why, why I chose Israel as a model for my book. So let's segue a little bit toward technology and innovation. And I'll tell you uh, what our interest in it is that last year, uh, the Okanagan Basin Water Board worked with an organization in Eastern Canada called the Aqua Forum in, to host the uh, British Columbia Aqua Hacking Challenge, it was called. It's a uh, uh, university, post-secondary students, early career professionals uh, competition for uh, water tech innovation. And this year we're hosting it again. This time we've expanded to Western Canada. And so we're really, we're early on, 
with um, this year's challenge, and we're looking at uh, uh, what water issues we should choose. And so, A, I want to ask you about how Israel fosters innovation in water technology. And B, I want to ask you what kinds of problems do you think are most uh, amenable to be solved with uh, technology? Uh, some water problems are more intangible, like source water protection we have here might be hard to solve with water technology. Other things are, you see where there's been a lot of development metering or something, that's obviously a tech thing. But I'm just, I wanna put it out there first after you talk about how Israel's fostered innovation to, um, just find, find out what your ideas are for, for those water issues that, that you think we should put to our aqua hackers coming in January. By the way, please invite me to give a rah-rah to them at the opening of the uh, hackathon. Um, so um, I, I'd like to share with you, I've, 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 uh, I've spoken extremely widely. I mean, unfortunately, I'm not doing it live anymore because of uh, coronavirus. I'm doing it virtually. But I've spoken to literally hundreds and hundreds of audiences all over the world, uh, including some of the greatest engineering schools in the world. And uh, shortly before, I've spoken at MIT a few times. And sh but shortly before the uh, plague began in, I guess, February, March, I spoke uh, to a nice audience uh, for a very well uh, attended um, uh, se series of talks on, uh, that were at MIT. And I asked this fairly crowded auditorium, I, I, of in, I was MIT, I'm sorry, make clear, anybody doesn't know, is a, a great school of engineering. Um, and um, uh, I asked the audience, by a show of hands, how many of them were thinking that they would like to be hired upon graduation by Google? I, I gave, I, I, this was the bucket, not just Google. Google, eBay, Facebook, um, Amazon, Netflix, uh, you know, I listed, you know, all the usual suspects, you know, you could, you could sort of put the list together yourself. You know what I'm talking about, you know, IBM, maybe Apple, you know, and so forth. I said, how many of you would like that? I said, but don't answer yet. I said, or how many of you would like to work for a water technology company. <laughs> so, so it got exactly the reaction I wanted, which was I didn't want to show of hands. I got a guffawing and laughing and really it, it, got, it was a wonderful way to start the, 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 the uh, hour, converse, hour long conversation. Because my point was, and this is why I'm talking about the hackathon of course, is that it's really very important for us to help um, encourage the best engineering minds, the best economic minds, the best sociological minds, the best public policy minds to go into the world of water. And, and that we want, we want people to do that and we want innovators to think that if they're gonna put a year or two or three into developing something special, that there's gonna be an economic payday for doing that because again, people respond to the economic incentives as well as you know, the praise of society and so forth. So, so I think that that's a wonderful thing to do, the hackathon, and to encourage water solutions. So, so thank you for doing that. Now, the question about what it is that Israel does to foster that sense of innovation, to, to, just to be clear about, about this, um, when I interviewed the now deceased but really wonderful former president of Israel named Shimon Peres, whose name you may know, he won the Nobel uh, Prize, I, I believe, as well, um, uh, Peace Prize, um, uh, Peres, um, said to me once about Israelis that they are forever restless and forever dissatisfied. And um, maybe that's true of everyone everywhere, but maybe more so there. And the way they channel that is in two ways. One is they, they to use a, a, a word that probably no one on this call will know, but they fetch a lot. They complain constantly. <laughs> that's one thing they do. The second thing they do is they innovate. And this is why Israel, which is a country of not even, not just barely a little over 9 million people, why this is why Israel has more companies on the NASDAQ than any other country in the world other than the United States itself. And that's why, that's why there are 300 and something number, between 300 and 350 water technology companies in tiny little Israel. 
to say nothing of health tech and medical devices and and cybersecurity and so on and so forth. So, so to, I need to start by giving sort of the master framework that the society itself thinks very much about the idea of that. The second thing is that Israel doesn't punish failure. Failure in, in much of the world is, oh, my son, he tried, he went, he worked in such and such, he went to a startup, it failed. Okay, I told him now it's time to get a real job. Okay, in Israel, it's, a, it's a sort of an opposite joke type thing, which is, what, you've only been at three failed startups? I'm like, what's wrong with you? Keep going, you know? So, the, so the, there's this hunger to get it right. And then finally, there's this real belief in the power of technology to right the world's problems of all kinds. And so, and, and so source water protection, I disagree with you. I think that there are technological solutions for that, but you have to be prepared to think about it and invest in it and, 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 and reward people for it. Now, there's another structural thing that Israel does that's fantastic and that I admire very much. They don't have a lot of central planning, but what they do do is they want to encourage technology and they want to discourage people from, in, from private investors from feeling that they have to bear the burden of it. So what Israel does is they have a, a program by which any company that's inventing technology gets two very significant benefits. The first benefit they get is a financial one, which is the government will cover the 80% of the first two years R&D budget for every approved company. Now you have to go through a process, but I'm not talking about like three or four companies a year. I'm talking about hundreds of companies a year qualify for this. And, and, and 80%, so 20% has to be paid by the investors and all of the infrastructure and all of the rent and all the salaries that has to be paid for by the investors. But if it succeeds, the government only gets their money back. That's all they get back. But what the government also gets is they get enhanced tax revenues. So when I last looked at this, I was told that the government had spent about $800 million um, US dollars on these subsidies, but they had gotten back $3.7 billion in enhanced tax revenues from these startups that went, then were sold to international companies and the purchase prices led to taxes that came back as enhancements, to say nothing of stopping brain drain, to say nothing of giving people enhanced quality of life, to say nothing of the fact that you're improving the water picture of your country. The second great thing that Israel does, I said that was the first, the second great thing that Israel does, I am, and I write about this at some length in my book, uh, in Let There Be Water, um, is something extraordinary. And that is the government assists every one of these would-be innovators by water innovators, by matching them up with either a local water utility, if it's a city-based innovation, or matches them up with a farmer, the, the farmers get a, a, a payment that will match any losses that they incur because they use this new technology, because some innovations are terrible. It's a very Darwinian world and some things suck. And, they, and in, in practice, in theory, it was great, but in practice, it doesn't, so they, it dies. If a farmer invests in something like that, they get, a, a, they get their money back. However, for all the utilities, if they don't partner with a certain number of, of such innovators every year, they have to pay an economic penalty. It's not a fine, but it's a penalty. So think of how amazing that is. Some young innovator, and I've met loads of these people, men and women, they come up with an idea, they find some investors, they develop it, it's ready for not quite export. It's not quite ready for international adoption, but it's good enough. They go, the government sets them up with a utility, and the utility then appoints some senior person to be the partner and the mentor for this program and to make sure it gets populated and socialized throughout the entire organization. And along the way, gives invaluable feedback to the innovator and says, if you'll do more of this and less of this, and change the color from blue to red or to green to orange, suddenly we'll like it better. And I can't begin to tell you how many significantly sized companies now have gone through that very process. So those are the two incredible things, and there's other things too, but time is short. So, but those are the two incredible things that an innovator does. Now, I wanna to say to anyone on this phone call who themselves is an innovator or has a son or daughter is an innovator or a nephew or niece who's an innovator or a next door neighbor, this program is not limited just to Israelis anymore. 
It used to be. But now, because Israel is so hungry for innovation, that the subsidies and the partnering programs are open to anyone anywhere in the world who wants to come to Israel through one of these innovation vehicles. So you talk about a hackathon, tell one of those hackers <laughs> that, that if they play their cards right, they're gonna have a very big deep pocketed partner. So we've got- And, and I think you were on, by the way, I think you muted yourself by accident. I, I'm sorry, to, but, I, but I think you said, you either said wow or something akin to wow. I'm I not sure. I said wow. Okay. <laughs> I was reading your lips. <laughs> So we've got another question from uh, Denise Nielsen, who's the chair of our uh, technical advisory body, the Water Stewardship Council. And she says- The, as the water, st water Stewardship Council? Yeah. Yes. Um, as a researcher, I have long been an advocate of drip irrigation. However, we are now learning that there are some detrimental side effects to agroecosystems, i.e. reductions in the ability of farms to sequester carbon. To what extent does Israeli water policy address wider environmental issues? Um, I think they do, but um, I think I'd said earlier that Israel, you know, focused on security, immigration, and, um, and water as their three big must-haves. Um, Israel is, has, a, has a mature and sophisticated environmental protection agency, um, but it is not that, uh, and, and I would say it's possibly better than certain Western countries' uh, systems, no, no, names, no names now for the next 70 days. Uh, but, um, uh, but I would say that uh, uh, it, it not necessarily is the case that Israel, um, I, I know your question was specific to drip irrigation, but I'm, and I, but I'm not answering about drip because I have a lot of things to say about drip if anybody wants to hear me. I, I mean, I, I could talk for very, I'm thinking of writing my next book about just drip irrigation. That's how excited I am about it. Uh, about it. I'm aware of the issue that you're talking about. Was, was it Denise? Was that the name? Denise. Denise. I'm aware, Denise, of the issue that you're talking about. And maybe offline, I gave my contact information before, but Anna or, or Corey or uh, James could share it if anyone missed it. Um, or maybe whoever's managing the chat can send out the contact information. Um, but um, uh, I, I think that this is an area where Israel is no more advanced than say Canada or any other country. They try to get it right. They obviously try to be very forward looking as, and they very much take seriously the environmentalism in Israel. I, I, I hasten to add one other very interesting thing about Israel and environmentalism. Whereas in the United States, um, when we think of environmentalism, the allies of environmentalism tend to be liberals or Democrats. I think that's pretty much the case. Excuse me very much. And, um, and that uh, people who are less inclined towards environmentalism, I'm saying antagonistic to it, but less inclined, tend to be conservatives or Republicans. I, I, I think, again, I'm not, I don't want to overgeneralize because I'm sure there were Democrats who are anti and Republicans who are pro, but, but, but that's, I think, the general sort of assumption by most people. Um, in Israel, curiously, there is not the same divide. Because I would say there's not here either. I, I think here, protection of water, especially, is completely nonpartisan. Uh, but I'm going to go further than that. In Israel, the right wingers, who are great nationalists, they love, they love the country. But there is because of the Bible. I'm not saying that they, they, most of them are not religious, by the way. But they, but the Bible is their foundational text, because they love the land of Israel, not just the political entity of Israel they are also quite zealous about environmental protection because they want to protect God's, again, they, they, many of them are atheists, but, but they want to protect what is the heritage of, of the country. So, so it's, it's, an interest, it's an interesting sort of sidebar, which by digression here. Back, back to Denise's question though, is that there is some concerns uh, 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 here and there about, about drip irrigation, but that the benefits so completely outweigh the detriments and the and I I think I'm familiar with the with the uh, the study that you're talking about, the academic study you're talking about, but that the although there might be others that I'm unfamiliar with, uh, but that that the weight of the academic evidence is so significantly in favor of drip irrigation, that um, that it, that um, I I would argue in favor. Further furthermore, is I think that for me one of the greatest concerns of of today, or not a single greatest concern, there's a few. I will I will list them. Number one is, is that water scarcity. 
So with drip irrigation, you save up to 60% of the water because much less water is lost to evaporation. Um, um, groundwater degradation, uh, when you flood irrigate or center pivot irrigate, you almost always over fertilize. So that means that you're going to lead to nitrification of groundwater when you do that. And with drip irrigation, you nutrigate most plants, which is to say you put exactly the amount of, of nutrient and fertilizer, fertigation it's called, in with your drip irrigation. And so therefore, you have no surplus of fertilizer, which then leaches into the groundwater. Another great global concern, not in Canada, not in the United States really, is food security. There's a lot of hungry people in the world and drip irrigation leads to approximately a 15 to 40% greater yield for all kinds of reasons I love talking about, but I won't do it here. And, um, and, and finally, for people who, again, this is not a big Canadian issue, uh, but for me, and I suspect for many people on this call who think of themselves as feminists, whether a woman or not, you can be a feminist, of course. Um, the fact of the matter is that although we think of the farmer as being a man, in much of the world, the person who is tending the garden or certainly getting the water for the garden is a woman and a girl. And having to go back and forth several times a day is exhausting. Putting the water on your head leads to spinal fractures. Little girls become filthy and exhausted, have no energy left to go to school. So the cycle of poverty and illiteracy is not broken. And what you find is that when drip irrigation is added to the mix, because it uses so much less water and is so much, um, is, is, has so many other benefits, that you can break some of that cycle of poverty. And so I'm a, I'm a on balance, I, again, nothing is perfect, but on balance, I am a gung-ho advocate of, of drip irrigation. You should definitely write that book, Seth. <laughs> and, okay. and Denise will send you some articles. Denise, uh, please be sure you follow up. No kidding around. It, it's interesting that you tie drip irrigation into, into um, you know, girls and women's education and um, feminism and, you know, recognizing water as a, as a human right. I'd also like to let the audience know that uh, Seth donates all the proceeds from his books to charity. And um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about some of the charities you're supporting with this? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, and I, I want to, want to make clear that I, I've done that, um, uh, for, in part because it's nice that I can, can do it. I mean, I, I've been, I've been very fortunate. My wife and I've been very fortunate. Uh, we both grew up with no money, but, um, um, you know, I, I started a business. I left the law at a young age and I started a business and that grew to be a hugely successful business. And so I was very fortunate when I sold the business that I decided I was going to devote the rest of my life to public service. As I think I mentioned earlier, if not on this call, then to you earlier, James. And, um, and the reason I've decided, I'll tell you about the charities, but I want to give the reason why I decided to donate 100%, not the net. I cover all the expenses myself. I, I decided to do it was because I didn't want anyone to think I was hyping the issue. I didn't want anyone to say, oh, well, he's selling books. That's why he's doing it. I didn't want that to be the phenomenon. I wanted people to, to I mean, I don't advertise the fact that I donate these books, uh, the money to charity. It's not on the book or anything like that. But to the extent that somebody would challenge it, I wanted to be clear that, um, that my motivation is purely to raise awareness and to get people uh, agitated or concerned about these very issues. And as to where I donate uh, the money, um, the first book being so much tied to Israel, um, I decided to fund uh, a, a series of uh, master, two master's degrees um, uh, scholarships and one PhD student scholarship at leading Israeli universities in water studies. Um, I funded, my wife and I with the royalties funded um, a Palestinian Israeli high school program um, uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, it's funded out of an organization in Tel Aviv, but it covers the entire Jerusalem region. Uh, um, to educate high schoolers about water issues and, and also how they can work cooperatively together. It's, it's sort of a, a peace, peace, not a peace Nick idea, but sort of a coexistence idea, I think you would call it. Um, and um, I helped to fund a uh, reservoir for farmers. Um, uh, uh, it, it, the reason for that is that farmers need water not all year long, but seasonally they need water. And, um, and therefore, uh, sewage, which is produced pretty much in equal amounts throughout the entire year, is being produced every day. And you need to have some storage facilities for that water. 
And so I, I, I made a decision with many others to help create an, uh, uh, an aquifer, a series of aquifers to help hold that water, a holding pen, so that that way you could make good solid use of that wastewater. In terms of the second book, um, what I've primarily done with the proceeds there is, um, again, for those who know the book, it's, it's probably be of less interest to you all in Canada because it's more about the United States than, than global issues. But um, one of the most moving, I did many, many interviews for both books. The first book, I did 220 interviews, uh, 220 interview subjects, about 585 interviews. Uh, the second book, I did close to 100 interviews, uh, about 225 interviews in all, and interview subjects uh, and, and interviews. And the most moving by far was with a man named John Doyle, who was with the Crow Nation in Montana. And they are uh, economically deprived community, which has just abysmal water outcomes, just abysmal. And um, I really, in interviewing him, it really broke my heart to hear this story. Uh, I have a special softness for indigenous peoples generally. Uh, I know that the name of your own community comes from, uh, I think you call them native peoples or not indigenous peoples, but whatever the name, it's the same idea. Um, and so I've decided to donate the royalties from the second book to most of it, at least not all of it, to the Crow Nation. Uh, we're, uh, we're in conversation with a variety of ideas. Initially, it was gonna be to fund a PhD program uh, for a young woman. Uh, uh, and then the community came to me and said, you know, it would be helpful if you consider funding something much more basic. We have no licensed plumbers in the entire 2.2 million acre reservation. Um, and if somebody needs to get a mortgage or buy a house, they can't, they can't use any local su supplier vendor because there's no one here to do it. And I thought, wow. So for a relatively small amount of money, I could help to transform this community. So so, um, uh, so it's something that's in development and uh, working very closely with the head of local college and local um, uh, vocational arts uh, um, program and uh, others. Uh, I've met probably about 10 or 12 uh, people from that community. Again, all virtually, I, I haven't been able to get there. And, but as soon as, as soon as I'm able to travel, Montana will be one of the very first places I'm gonna go because I'm dying to meet these fabulous people. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for letting us know all of that, Seth. And I, I just want to clarify, um, having finished the second book, that it's very relevant to Canada as well. Uh, a lot of focus on water quality, water pollution, governance and regulation about chemicals, uh, microplastics, all, all sorts of things, uh, endocrine disruptors and hormones in the water system and technologies. And the last chapter in the book is actually entitled What You Can Do Now. And so I think that's relevant for the audience and for general for sure that. public who are sure. always asking. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure that part. So that, I, I, I'll take any endorsement I can get. So thank you very much. <laughs> but, I want to come to back to the, um, huh? to the a question that I asked you right at the very beginning. Um, I'm really curious to have the book too. I'm very curious. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> what, what has happened in the interview? intervening years that what kind of progress have you seen in the intervening years you're very bullish on uh, Israeli water security and water abundance and this was published in 2015 and and just like what you know, like off the top of your head what things have happened since you published this book and then also not just sticking to Israel but just in general what what sort of uh, water management trends are you excited about looking into the future, especially given we've got climate change, we've got global population growth, we have all these kind of things happening, but what makes you really excited yeah. about? Um, and, and, awesome. and, by, and by the way, you left out the fact that we have an overhang from coronavirus, which has, oh, yeah. which has sucked millions and billions and trillions of dollars out of budgets and the ability to fix problems are going to be set back by years or decade or generation maybe even in some places so so it requires even more hard thinking everyone on this call you know god knows let's all be partners and come up with great plans and programs um so um so first of all um i i i, I because of time i won't give an exhaustive answer but i'll give an i'll give an example or two the first part of the I, question I, was yeah. The first, the first part of the question was, you know, what have you seen in the past five years? So, so let me share something that, unless you're totally a water wonk, 
you won't be aware of. Uh, but what you are aware of, I'm sure, anyone involved in water supply at all, is aware of the fact that cybersecurity has become a very large concern. Uh, cybersecurity vulnerability has become a very large concern in the world of water. Um, uh, again, speaking just the United States, there are 16 critical uh, infrastructures in the United States. Water and wastewater is ranked 16th out of 16 in terms of preparedness for cyber attack. And we're not talking about some teenager, you know, in his parents' basement or talking even about some criminals doing some ransomware or even some terror group trying to blow things up. We're talking about state actors. We're talking about the U.S. government. I'm not sharing any of that secret. I've been shared this with by U.S. government officials that it is beyond any question, they believe, that China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran have infiltrated uh, America's um, uh, uh, water infrastructure and planted malware strategically on a number of places and that at an appropriate moment, they will be uh, executed. They will be activated. I don't mean executed, they will be activated. Now, I mentioned that just to frame the issue. So about a, within the last year, I forget exactly the date, um, Israel foiled the first public or well-known state-to-state cyber attack in water. And that is the Iranian government atta attacked a water facility in Israel through cyber, enhanced the amount of chemicals being added to the water, and had they succeeded, many thousands of people would have been poisoned and possibly died. However, we talked before about Israel's technical, technological innovation leadership. Israel has been getting ready for a, a cyber attack on its critical infrastructure for several years now. And again, I won't go into the details of that here, but I've been thinking about it because I've been thinking of writing, an, I, when I'm thinking about it, I've been doing research for an article I'm thinking of writing, I'm wanting to write. So, um, so Israel, has, Israel has, that's why I know all the stuff about from US government officials and all that. So, so Israel to some extent is leading the way. And I know that after this attack was were made public by the Israelis and, and they showed the definitive proof that it was Iran that had done it, um, lots of people around the world from cyber authorities and water authorities came to Israel and said, show us what we can be doing to protect both our IT, our, our, you know, our, our tech stuff, and also our operating technology, our pipes, our pumps, our valves, our cicada. How do we protect that? from an attack, whether it's from a state actor or terror group, a criminal group or, or, or some teenager. And so that's a mega trend, which I think over the next few years is gonna gain a lot of velocity because the cost of getting this wrong is very, very significant. So that's one thing. The second thing is that, is that success breeds success. And from the confidence that Israel has had by seeing successful water companies and seeing around the world um, utilities and others coming to understand that Israel has answers, that last year, uh, I think it was 2019, some 6,500 water officials from around the world came to visit Israel to learn from Israel. That's a really large number of people coming to a small country. So, so that's one very significant thing. Now on the more macro trend, I would say that I believe that there is a higher level of awareness around the issues that I raised in the, my two books. And the reason I say that is, again, just prior to coronavirus, <clears throat> I was being invited to address parliaments far afield from, from Chile, to Argentina, Brazil, uh, meeting with, uh, meeting, I was invited to meet with the prime minister of uh, India, a scheduling problem very much unfortunately uh, couldn't allow me to do it. My wife's oldest friend's son's wedding uh, was the exact same day. <laughs> And my wife made very clear which was a priority. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I didn't get a chance to, to go in that time. And then maybe after coronavirus, I'll be able to go. But, um, but there's, lots of, there's lots of very senior officials who are now concerned about these issues in a way they weren't before. I think there might be another trend, which I'm hoping is, is, is going to activate. And maybe coronavirus will help this through. And that is to have more market forces, more real pricing for water. Um, becoming smart about this. And, I, and again, I'm not sure the following thing is true, but I see this in the United States in the Southwest and the Southeast and in other water uh, constrained places 
where master planning is starting to play a role in the thinking of management and of governance. So, um, and there are other things that I'm, that this co early conversations about greater consolidation, because having such a vast number of water entities is probably not a good idea for the public. But those are the primary uh, things that are going on. I will also say, with some frustration, that change in the world of water comes to my taste way too slowly. Um, and um, there's a lot of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality in the industry. Uh, but I, I believe that that will have no choice but to change as, pr as problems grow and as automation is not the uh, end all to the problems that have been identified. The last uh, speaker that we had um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, who's an old friend of the organization, but he, uh, his one criticism for us and the work that we're doing right now is that we need to have a higher sense of urgency and uh, like he sees change coming very quickly and that we need to get on it. And um, so I've been thinking about that a lot the last two or three weeks. And uh, what oh, you say echoes that. You know, one of the things I say in, in Troubled Water, the second book, um, and again, I know we're primarily talking about Let There Be Water tonight, but one of the things I say in, in uh, Troubled Water is that you can't think of another major important industry in, in our, your country or around the world, uh, which over the past hundred years hasn't gone through radical transformation, communications, transportation, military, hardware, retailing. Uh, I mean, I, we, we almost couldn't stop making the list. Yet in water, we are largely treating wastewater the way we did about a hundred years ago. And we are largely treating drinking water the way we did about 100 years ago. And if I may segue into something that's uh, very much on my mind all the time lately, uh, lately the last few years, is the, is the proliferation of pharmaceutical agents in our drinking water. And I think, if I may say, Anna, the public does not know about this issue yet, but they will, not because of me, they will. This will get out. And the fact is that people are drinking cocktails of pharmaceutical residue all over the world, including in your community. People are taking, uh, communities are taking their wastewater and dumping it either into a river or into a lake. They think it's treated, it's treated up to whatever the federal code is or the provincial code is. And you can say, we're being legal and you are. And I, I know you very well or well enough to know that you are a good, caring, public servant and that you want only the best and you are doing everything the law requires and then some more <clears throat> but what has happened in those hundred years since these technologies were invented is that we have changed the way we live our lives most 80 percent 80 percent of adults 12 and over now in the united states and i'm guessing in canada as well 80 percent of adults 12 and over take at least one prescription drug a day <clears throat> and 25% take five or more prescription pills a day. Now, that drug, most of that drug is, is excreted into the water supply within a matter of hours. And if it's not within a matter of hours, and certainly when you sweat it into your clothing within a matter of days. The residues then get taken to the wastewater treatment plant, and we are very good at purifying that water in the way we did 100 years ago before there were any pharmaceutical products other than maybe aspirin. And so that goes into our water supplies. And then we take the water out for drinking water. We treat it with something like some type of chlorine. And then we put it into, uh, uh, we put it into the water supply. Now, what's remaining in that, though, is the, even in great bodies of water, what remains in that is pharmaceutical agents. And if I can share just one quick story, a professor at the University of Buffalo on the far eastern, right on the border of Canada, but on the far eastern side of your country, um, ran an experiment. She wanted to take a drug that could only be excreted by humans. So she got a federal U.S. government grant to study fish in the five Great Lakes, a whole variety of species. She pulled those fish out and she discovered that in more than half of all the fish, regardless of the Great Lake, now the Great Lakes are, the, are these great oceanic bodies of water. And we've all heard the expression, the solution to, uh, solution to pollution is dilution. Well, polluted matters would be diluted in the Great Lakes. But instead, she found that in more than half of all the fish she pulled out of the Great Lakes, 
they had in their brains, in their organs, and in their muscle, the stuff we eat, they had in their brains Celexa and Zoloft and 14 other psychiatric medications, which means that everything that we are excreting that is not getting treated out is coming back at us in our water supply. Hmm. In micro doses, in different doses, but we don't know what the long-term effect of that is gonna be on our children, on fetuses, on immunosuppressed people, of which there are many more now because of coronavirus, on people on chemotherapy and so forth. And these, what drives me completely crazy about this is, you know, I'm a good natured kid, a guy I like to joke around a lot and all that, but, but, but I have a serious side too. And the serious side is that when there's a problem that can be solved and solved easily, and we are not addressing it, because, and it's not even that expensive to address it. We're just not addressing it because no one's screaming about it yet. Why do we have to wait till they scream about it? Let's get ahead of the problem. Let's be like the Israelis. Let's get ahead of the problem. Let's fix the problem today. We'll start discussing the problem and let's fix, fix all that. And let's get into the idea. Uh, I think somebody just wrote me once last time you ate something. I can't see the rest of the question is, but let's get, let's get ahead of the problem and, and, and start fixing it. Now, by the way, to be clear, I'm not talking about the fear about eating fish. It's not that the stuff is in the fish, is in the fish that we're eating. The problem, what I'm trying to de demonstrate is that it's in the drinking water that we are extracting for our water supplies and that chlorine is not, is not ridding this water of those agents. It's ridding it of pathogens, which obviously you need to do, but it's not taking care of this other problem. So I didn't mean to go on, I don't mean to be on a high horse, but, but I want to, to do my best to make the point that I could here. And, and I just want to be completely clear, Seth, because we actually discussed this a little bit last time we talked, that the technology exists to, to filter all of this stuff out. And, and I also want to just make sure that, that you, Seth, and the listening audience knows we have done some work on this issue with endocrine disruptors here in the Okanagan water supplies in uh, the Okanagan Lake. Um, it was below detection limits. So, and that's uh, good news then. That's great news. It's good news, yes. Yeah. Okanagan I, I, River I, I, Channel and Penticton, where everybody goes tubing, that had quite a lot of, uh, relatively speaking, of the- and By the way, and Anna, it doesn't surprise me that you're ahead of the curve. It, do it really doesn't, no, knowing you. It 10 years ago, man, 10 yeah. years ago. You know, not, 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 not surprise me that you, James, uh, and your team are ahead of the curve, really, not at all. But, but the fact of the matter is, it's a big world out there, and not enough of this is going on. Yeah. So we're at the end of our time now, and- oh. Yeah. <laughs> I just like You're going to have to come back. Yeah, well, I think we're talking about something even bigger. Me coming back and uh, doing something with you guys uh, next spring, I think. I think we're talking about some, some fun stuff. That you know, would be great. We're, uh, we're getting to be a real globally recognized wine region, and I'm sure that you drink wine, Seth, so we'd love to have you. And oh, was, it my, was it my slurred speech that gave that away? <laughs> Well, anyway, listen, this has been a joy. Um, you know, I, I, I do a great number of these, a, a great, great number of these, uh, sometimes even three in a single day. And uh, I have to say, I can't remember the last time I've been, in, forget about the, the time together, how much I enjoyed it, but, but the preparation and the seriousness with which, seriousness, but in a very good hearted way of getting to know you, all of you and having multiple sessions to make sure this is a, a great evening for your, all your many participants. So. So uh, I want to thank you for taking it so seriously and taking this process seriously. And, and if anybody hasn't gotten the book yet, God knows, what, what do you, what's, what do you keep, what's keeping you? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Seth, again, for your time. And um, it, yeah, uh, again, just on behalf of the Okanagan Basin Water Board and the people who joined us today. And, and if you follow me on Twitter, I'll be tweeting about this in a few minutes. Okay. I'm going to follow you on Twitter right after this. Okay, then I'll wait five minutes before I talk about how great it was. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks for this great invitation. I appreciate it so much. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Just let everyone know this has been recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel, uh, I believe, okanaganwaterwise.ca. Thank you.